First of all, let me say that I have worked with the Mossville group since the 1970s. And we have been through a lot, an awful lot. And the community has been exposed to very, very, very toxic emissions, not only from the air, but also from the water sources, because we had a contaminated water source at the municipality of Mossville, and then the contaminated soil and sediment as well. So everything possible to get the agencies to take action have, for the most part, not worked. The emissions coming out of the industrial facilities are extremely, extremely toxic and in excess of their permit, their air permits, their water permits, and their hazardous waste permits. But tonight we're focused on the liquefied natural gas facilities. So starting off at the top, natural gas is primarily methane. And methane has a horrible, horrible track record of causing greenhouse gas emissions and the climate change that's going on. And that methane is transported to the Gulf Coast areas of Louisiana and Texas via pipelines from natural gas production fields throughout the United States. So when you talk about, I live by one of the LNG facilities, the natural gas that's coming into those facilities to be exported to foreign countries is coming from all over the United States by pipeline. And as a result of that, it comes also from Haynesville Shale in North Louisiana that also extends into Northeast Texas, the Barnett Shale in North Texas, and the Eagle Ford Shale in Southwest Texas. And I have worked with the communities in those three production fields throughout those production fields. The natural gas pipeline corridor extends to the Gulf of Mexico. So one, that's a reason why they are located where they are, because the pipelines extend right to where they are. And there are other reasons as well. And when the natural gas is received at the LNG facilities, it has condensate in, in it, it's a liquid portion. It has carbon monoxide and has sulfur compounds. And all of those chemicals and that natural gas liquid needs to be removed before it is processed and put in the ships to go to foreign countries. So what happens is they process the natural gas after they remove those compounds, and then they cool it. Because when you cool natural gas, it shrinks in volume. And so they cool it down to minus 260 degrees. So you know how cold it's going to be tonight? It's 40 degrees, and everybody's going to be ruled. Well, they cool it down to minus 260 degrees to make it into a liquid that decreases in volume so that they can ship it and ship a lot more in those ships. So the liquid natural gas is then stored in large refrigerated storage tanks on the LNG facility. So those are the great big tanks you see. And in just a moment, I'll show you some pictures of that. And everything in that tank is liquid natural gas, very cold and very compressed. And so one of the dangers is if it gets released into the air, methane is explosive, right? If you have a gas stove, you have a pilot light, and when you turn the stove on, the natural gas makes a flame. So if it exits that storage tank and there's a mechanism to spark it, then it's going to be a huge, huge explosion that's going to damage and destroy everything in a great big area, including 
the areas where some of you may live close to it. The larger the capacity of the LNG facility, the more processing train lines they have and the more storage tanks that they have to store it in in the liquid form. So due to the war between Russia and the Ukraine, the majority of the LNG that's being exported from these facilities in Cameron Parish are going to European countries because Russia stopped the natural gas from being sold to European countries. So you, the downside is you have to remember there are people in the European countries that are going to freeze to death this winter. But that's why they need all the natural gas. So with the push for more and more natural gas to be exported to European countries, there's a need to drill and produce more natural gas in a lot of the shale areas in Louisiana and Texas as well as the rest of the United States. And the United States ranks third in the quantity of LNG that's exported to foreign countries. So that means we already rank third and there's a push for more and more of these <coughs> facilities to export to those countries. So this is the area, because it's on the Gulf and the ships can come in, this is the area that will be most vulnerable to not only the facilities we have now, but proposed facilities. And there was a newspaper that said about a new facility that's being proposed. So what happens when you offloading of LNG? The LNG ships reach their destination in a foreign country, and that liquefied LNG is warmed to make it into a gas. So it expands and it becomes a gas, and then they put it in the pipeline and ship it wherever you need it. So it may go to this country, it may go to that country, wherever they are most need of it. But from the ship, it becomes gas again, and then it's put in the pipelines and shipped out. So LNG export facilities, there are eight export facilities in operation in the United States right now. And they are with the largest number of LNG facilities in various phases of development. And y'all know that because you see it in the paper that there are new ones being proposed all the time. So the LNG export facilities in Calcasieu Cameron Parish area, there are three. The Venture, let's start back. The Sempra Cameron one in Hackberry is on Highway 27 below Sulphur. The Venture Global is in Cameron and it's right there on the coast. When you take 27 to the coast, it's right there across the, the Calcasieu ship channel. I've been doing too much work in Houston. And it's right there in the heart of the community of Cameron. And then the third one is the Chenier, and it's in Sabine Pass. So it's in Cameron Parish in Louisiana. And then right before Sabine River flows into the Gulf of Mexico. So there's also proposed LNG facility in March of this year. DEQ held a public hearing on a proposed Commonwealth one. So you need to start watching the newspapers about the Commonwealth one. The facility is to be located at the intersection of the Calcasieu Ship Channel and the Gulf of Mexico, not on the Cameron side, but right across the ship channel from Cameron. It's going to be right there as the ship channel flows into the Gulf of Mexico. The LNG, the public hearing, was for a Part 70 air operating permit. That's just one of many permits they need. And the PSD permit and environmental assessment statement. The hearing was held in Cameron, and I testified at the hearing. And the issue was, that was when the war was in full flow. And so as we sat there and testified that night, it was like 
This is not the place or the technology to put this, but the people of Europe are desperate for the natural gas that would be exported for this, this facility. So then Commonwealth is proposed to construct and operate a natural gas liquefied export facility and integrate natural gas pipeline in Cameron Parish. The facility is to be located on the west side of the Calcasieu Chip Channel at the entrance to the Gulf of Mexico. So we already have one in Cameron as the ship channel goes into the Gulf. And this one's going to be right across from that one. And this is going to mess up the hydrology as the ship channel flows into the Gulf. And when they put the docking facilities for those ships, they're dredging out huge quantities of soil. So that's going to mess up all the flow and start eroding both channels as it goes out into the Gulf of Mexico. The proposed Commonwealth facility will consist of six natural gas liquefying trains to process 65.1 billion cubic feet of natural gas a year. Six liquefied trains, six pretreatment trains, and then there will be six of the storage tanks for the liquefied material. And they will have two flare systems that will consist of four flares. So those of you who have plans and issues with the flares, that facility will have four flares. And there's also to be two flare systems for, for the four flares, and then a three mile long pipeline to connect to all those pipelines that are flowing down from here to make it to where their facility is located. On November, on July 21st, Commonwealth approved raising their expedited cap to 7,000. So what happens is I have a permit application. I submit it to DEQ and then I say, I want to pay you money to review my permit. I want you as my permit author. So who are they looking out for? themselves getting the money and the agency issuing the permit. And they upped it since the hearing and said, more money is available to me for me to pay you. So you're going to sit at the hearing and you're going to listen to everybody's testimony and you just going to blow them off because you wrote the permit. You got money to write the permit. It's your permit. And you would be defending the permit and telling everybody else what your comments were don't count because you knew that you did the best permit you could and you were paid individually to do it. And you got overtime to do it. So it was more money than you usually take home in your paycheck. That's how the process works. And so who is it benefiting the company, not the people who live in the area and will be negatively impacted. And then after the hearing, the Federal Emergency Response Commission prepared and released their final environmental impact statement on that proposed facility. And FERC determined that the impact on environmental justice communities, you, was disproportionately high and adverse. So you're sitting there and you wrote the permit, but she's telling you it's going to impact all these community members negatively. So how do we get the two of y'all together? We don't. You get written off. You as the environmental justice community don't count because the best person at the agency wrote the permit. So that's the kind of things you have to be able to testify. But we already testified on the permit that they asked for. So then how do we determine and how do we bring the people together again and tell the agency this is not how you think it should work? That's a big, big issue that has to be addressed. And this is just a proposed one. This is not 
all the bad things that happen on the existing ones. So the first LNG facility in Calcasieu Parish, which was known as Lake Charles LNG, was an import. That was before the whole world needed our natural gas. It was an import facility. The ship came in and brought the LNG to that facility. It was located at 8100 Big Lake Road, and it was 12 miles southeast of Lake Charles on the Calcasieu Estuary. So it had the ship coming in the ship channel and then going into the estuary and docking at the facility, really below the airport in Lake Charles. So the permitting process began in 1978, and the last load of LNG was received in March of 12. Remember, it's import, not export. So on August the 30th of this year, DEQ did an inspection of the facility, and Kevin Natale, and Natale's a known name in the Lake Charles area, and Nicholas Bend performed a compliance evaluation inspection of that import facility. That remember, March 12 was the last import shipment. All tanks and lines had been purged and currently maintained with positive pressure of nitrogen until the end of 2016. And there was no discharge observed from the facility outfall when the inspectors went in there. So that's an issue we're, quote, supposed to just go away and not assume that all the contamination was cleaned up. So then we have LNG facility emergency events before we start talking about the specific ones in Cameron Parish. Chenier Sabine Pass. Have any of you heard of Chenier, which was having a big emergency event? January 22nd of 2016, it was discovered by a plant worker that one to six foot cracks were present in one of those big tanks at the Chenier Sabine Pass facility. The crack allowed the leakage of the liquefied natural gas into another layer of the tank, and then it became gaseous again. The U.S. Department of Transportation Pipeline and Hazardous Materials Safety Division ordered the Chenier facility to shut down those two storage tanks on February the 8th of 2018. The agency stated the tank could have created a flammable cloud of low-lying gas around the tank. Cracks were a result of incorrect operations. So she wrote the permit for it, and the agency is supposed to do the inspections of it. And oops, it had cracks, and oops, it leaked. And the agency said it was inappropriate. So who's enforcing the permit? Her agency is supposed to be enforcing it. But she's OK because she wrote the permit. But she's not in enforcement. So we're having to look at someone else like you for enforcement. And you have to communicate with her and ask her, why did you write the permit like this that allowed cracks? OK? So it's within the agency back and forth about how do we do this enforcement, okay? So the agency stated the tank could have created a flammable cloud of low-lying gas around the tanks. Cracks were a result of incorrect operation. The company knew the tank design was inadequate. So you, Ms. Permit Writer, did you know the design was inadequate when you were writing the permit? No. No, you thought you had tended to everything, right? Yeah. So then who do you look at as the fault? Two of the five storage tanks also did not have an alarm that would set to let it know when it was leaking. 
Chenier did not properly design the valves to withstand icing conditions, and a proposed $2.2 million federal penalty was proposed. When you propose a penalty, you go back and forth between the agency and the company and the agency and company. It may take 10 years, and they negotiate things usually down less money, but nothing has been paid according to the files for that event. So then we have Freeport LNG facility that had an incident. It had an explosion and a fire in their LNG terminal on June the 8th of this year. The facility exports 2 billion cubic feet of LNG per day, 15% of what is exported in the whole United States goes out of the Freeport facility. Excess emissions of carbon monoxide, nitrogen oxide, particulate matter, sulfur dioxide, and volatile organic compounds were released into the air. The facility returned to export capacity in late 2002, late this year. They were aiming for a restart in November of 2002. They didn't quite make it. And we're getting ready to move into December tomorrow. The cause of the fire was human error. So does she consider that when she's writing the permit? Do the communities consider that when they live around it? Human error? You are hoping that the people who designed and constructed and operated these facilities were better at doing their jobs than having human error say that's what caused the issue. The facility had a history of safety violations before the explosion. Then we moved to Cameron's LNG facility, had a leak of benzene. Benzene is a known human cancer causing agent, causes leukemia. Usually when children come down with leukemia, they go to the Danny Thomas Hospital. So the carcinogen was benzene, and it was leaked in July of this year. So even the facilities operating today are still having issues and events. Then we have LNG facility with the largest number of expo bursts. When a couple of the people came in, they were talking about they didn't want the ships coming in that area, OK? So let's look at who has the largest number of places the ships can come in, take that liquid, put it in the ships, and go to those foreign countries. The Chenier Pass facility is the largest U.S. explorer. Largest one is at Chenier, right where the Sabine hits the Gulf of Mexico. The facility has three berths to dock and load three tankers. The third berth was added this year. The other two facilities operating along the Gulf have either one or two docking, and Chenier has three. On September the 7th of this year, three tankers docked simultaneously at Chenier. All three tankers will not be, quote, loaded simultaneously. One will finish loading and get ready to leave. Two, second tanker is being loaded while the third tanker is just arriving. So you've got three tankers, and you can see later they have six storage tanks, all sitting there with LNG in them or just getting ready to take it in them and you have the potential of explosive capacity of the six tanks and the three ships. So let's look at the toxic air emissions and greenhouse gases that are released in large quantities by the operators of the LNG facility. The negative health impacts cause severe negative impacts to the minority populations and low-income populations in the areas around the LNG facility as a result of toxic chemicals being released into the air, into the water, into the soil, 
and to the sediment, as well as causing a negative impact to aquatic and terrestrial flora and fauna, fish and vegetation. Each of the LNG export facilities are allowed to release large quantities of toxic chemicals from emissions points, from progressing equipment, ship loading activities, flaring events, and bypasses. The quantities of these toxic chemicals permitted to be released by their air permit, that remember she wrote that permit, consist of hundreds to thousands of pounds and tons per year of those toxic chemicals. Okay, Title V semi-annual deviation reports. Title V deals with a lot of the toxic air emissions. Each LNG facility is required to report on a semi-annual basis their permit deviations, their oopses that occur. So we're going to start with the Sabine Pass LNG facility. It reported the following deviations to time periods and, and I'm focused on 2002, January 1 of 2002 through June the 30th of 2000, and, I mean 20, not 22. The deviations consisted of five days in January, 18 days in February, 10 days in March, eight, nine days in April, four days in May, 21 days in June. And that's the six month report. The chemicals released during that 65 deviation events, those OOPS events, as excess emissions were associated with emissions to the flares, and we're going to see flares in a little while, venting to the flares, visible emissions observed on the flare, upset venting to the flare, blowdowns, defrost activities, they must have had ice on the outside of those tanks. Shut down activities, start up activities, fuel gas warm up, upset activities, maintenance activities, equipment failure and malfunction. Those are the chemicals that it caused those 65 events in the first half of 2020. The quantity of chemicals released during those 65 days Carbon monoxide, 24,000 pounds or 12.39 tons. Nitrogen oxide, more than 2,000 pounds, 1.19 tons. Volatile organics, the really toxic chemicals, 25.7 pounds, 12.88 tons. Hexane, 30 pounds, 0.015 tons. So chemicals allowed to be released into the air from permitted LNG facilities consists of the following. Methane, which is natural gas, major source of greenhouse gas emissions. But they handling methane, ethane, propane, butane, pentane, volatile organics, benzene, remember, causes leukemia, known human cancer causing agent, toluene xylene, ethyl benzene, formaldehyde, naphthalene, methylene chloride, propane, criteria pollutants, carbon monoxide, nitrogen oxide, sulfur dioxide, particulate matters 10 and 2.5, ozone, organic pollutants, acenaphthalene, acrylene, 1,3-butadiene, dichlorobenzene, n-hexane, polyaromatic hydrocarbons, naphthalene, propylene oxide, hexane, toxic heavy metals, lead, mercury, chromium, arsenic, cadmium, selenium, Silver, barium, naturally occurring radioactive material, radium-226, half-life 1,620 years, it's going to be there forever, radium-228, and radon. So human chemical exposure, individuals are exposed to the chemicals and toxins associated with and being released from the LNG facilities by living, working, recreating, visiting, the facilities, passing near the facilities, spending time in the areas surrounding the facilities. Individuals are being exposed to individual and cumulative toxic chemicals. Health impacts associated with those chemicals that are released 
into the environment by the operating facilities, acute health impacts, irritation to the skin, eyes, nose, throat, lung, lung. And when I come over here, I always get the drippy nose. Causes headache, coughing, wheezing, dizziness, convulsions, lightheadedness, nausea, vomiting, respiratory problems, pulmonary edema, chronic or long-term, heart disease, irregular heartbeat, aplastic anemia, cancer of the lung, liver, brain, kidney, leukemia, neurological system, angiosarcoma of the liver, damage to the male and female reproductive system, damage to the developing fetus, spontaneous abortion. Is that the kind of environment you want to live in? No. So then we talk about, let's find out how we get there. So this is a traveling tour of the three facilities that are operating. From Interstate 10 in Sulphur, you follow Highway 27 south to the Gulf of Mexico. In the Hatfield area, you will see a very large LNG facility on Highway 27, extending to the Calcasieu Estuary and the Ship Channel. This is Sempra Cameron LNG Hackberry. You will be able to see all of the units of the LNG facility, the storage tanks, and the ship loading facility from Highway 27. All you have to do is pull off on the shoulder and you can see it all. Following Highway 27 further south to the Gulf of Mexico, take the road to the Cameron Ferry. Ride the ferry across and see the very large Venture Global Calcasieu Pass LNG facility in Cameron. If you pull off in the parking lot of the Cameron Parish Library, you can get a great view of the LNG facility. Then you return and cross the ferry going west and you go along the road along the Gulf of Mexico. You follow what's called the Gulf Beach Highway, which is Highway 27 and 82, and you go on the coastal road towards Texas. Just before the state line between Louisiana and Texas, you will observe a Chenier Sabine Pass LNG facility along the Gulf of Mexico near the Sabine River. And if we'd have had time and enough daylight, and I hate this time, by five o'clock it would start, we could have taken a tour. So then we're looking at the incidents that have been reported in 2022. And this is what I really want you to focus on. This is operations, and these are things they have to report to her agency and say, we had excess emissions, we had these incidents, we've had problems, but it's okay because we have permits to operate as long as we submit those informations. And in some cases, we had community members complaining. So on January the 9th of this year, we're on page 14, at approximately 4.30, a leak was discovered. Operations were conducting routine area checks in train three and discovered a man-way flange leak on the deethanizing column. The leak was secured on January the 10th, the next day, at approximately 1710 hours. The reportable quantity of methane and ethane were exceeded. They have to report anything they exceed the reportable quantity. The material release vaporized into the atmosphere leaving no known off-site impacts as the action level. So who's out there to say you were passing by on Highway 27 and you breathed those emissions that were released? But who's that to say you didn't breathe those emissions that were released? The emissions associated with the discharge were methane, over 5,000 pounds, ethane, almost 2,000 pounds, propane, 151 pounds, and butane, 75.9 pounds. That was January 9th. On February the 3rd at 2.25, waste gas was released due to an oxidase causing the 
incinerator to go down. Big deal when the incinerator goes down. The waste gas diverted to the waste heat recovery unit, which does not burn as hot as the incinerator, leading to a possible air release. The constituents of concern in the waste gas was benzene, known human cancer-causing agent. The release was secured at 3.24 a.m., leading to a total release of 59 minutes. So what if you were driving by on 27, going to work in Cameron? You probably breathed it. The release estimates were benzene, two pounds, methyl ethane, 529 pounds, volatile organics, almost 12 pounds, toluene, 2.29 pounds, ethyl benzene, 0.07 pounds, and total xylene, 0.89 pounds. So these are oops events that they occur that they have to report to the agency. So now we move to February the 20th. At 1624 hours, a leak was discovered from deluge inductor screen on the condensate storage tank due to a failed ruptured disc. The reportable quantities for butane and pentane were exceeded. Total butane, 18 pounds. Pentane, 8,499 pounds. Benzene, 0 0.88 pounds. So as you're driving down Highway 27 to Cameron, do you call them and say, are you having an event? Or can I just drive by and I'll be safe? No, they're not available to answer your phone call to determine if you go down Highway 27, you will be safe. The material released vaporized into the atmosphere. Well, what are you breathing when you go down Highway 27, right up against the border of that facility? Operations assess the repair and replace the failed ruptured disc. The leak was secured February 21st at 1555 hours. But this kind of information doesn't get filed for a month or two after the event. So you can't say, I was passing and I had a really bad headache or runny nose, rash on my skin. Unless you start reporting these things to the agency, there's no way for you to tell what you might have been exposed to unless you wrote it down with date and time and where you were. And then we have June 15th at approximately 10, 919 hours, the thermal oxidizer b tripped subsequent acid was diverted to the propane refrigerated compressor exhaust stack of all three liquefaction trains. June 15th at approximately 1325, the release ended. Secondarily, on June the 15th at approximately 1424, the thermal oxidizers A and B trip, acid gas was once again diverted to the propane refrigerating compressor exhaust stack of all three liquid trains. On June 15th at approximately 1737 hours, the release ended. So is this giving you an idea that when they say their operations are perfect, and then you look at all of these excess emissions, and know that when you're going by, you may be the recipients, or when you live adjacent to the facility, you may be the recipients of those emissions. On June 15th, the restart of train two inadvertently caused a series of events resulting in reportable quantity exceedances of methane and benzene, known human cancer-causing agent, during a 24-hour rolling time frame. Both thermal oxidizer trip resulting in an unauthorized discharge through emission sources 1, 71, 72, and 73. The total emissions, benzene, 12 pounds, methyl and ethyl, 3,524 pounds, VOCs, 63 pounds, toluene, 10 pounds, ethyl benzene, 0.33 pounds, total xylene, 5.17 pounds. I know you get hard, tired of hearing this, but this is what's really going on with the operations of those facilities. And this is just 2022. On July 1st at 4.30,
the thermal oxidizers A and B tripped due to low fuel gas pressure caused by loss of power at the storage and loading and unloading area of the facility. Acid gas was diverted to the propane refrigeration compressor, exhaust stacks of all three liquefaction trains, transformer T, 1B at the storage loading and unloading powerhouse trip causing process equipment at the bus speed to shut down. Impacted equipment from that shutdown included the BOG compressor, subsequently goes on and on, total release, 45 pounds of benzene, methyl ethane, 13,000 bottled organic, 372 toluene, 30. And then in July 8, on the bottom of page 16, it gives you, again, benzene, see lots of benzene being released. On August the 25th, uh, it released on page 17, the reportable quantity of benzene and methane were exceeded a total emission. Benzene, 14 pounds, methane and ethane, 3,800, VOC, 72, September 7th, an emission. And then on page 18, we have criteria and toxic air pollutant that release from the facility for 2021. Criteria pollutants, carbon monoxide, and it tells you how much, nitrogen oxide, particulate matter, dust, sulfur dioxide, total volatile organic, 97 tons. Toxic air pollutants, class one, two, three. Toxic VOCs and toxic non-VOCs. This is just that one facility, Hackberry, LNG on Highway 27. Now we move to the second one. The following two pages are aerial photographs of the Venture Global Capuchy Pass facility in Cameron. The first aerial photograph shows the three liquefaction natural gas storage tanks, the two ship berthing docks, and the equipment located along the Gulf of Mexico and Calcasieu Pass. And you can see where the ships dock and how close they are to the tanks where the liquefied natural gas is stored. And the second aerial photograph of the Calcasieu Pass LNG facility shows a ship in the berthing area and three liquefied storage tanks. So that gives you an idea of what happens if there's a leak in the ship, at the same time if there's a leak in any one of the tanks, and how endangered the workers are in that area. So Venture Global on January the 18th of this year at approximately 927, a potential release above the reportable quantity of natural gas from the South LNG storage tank. Venting of nitrogen from the tank began January 15, and it ended January 17. Do you think they evacuated the people who live in Cameron? This is facility is in Cameron, right where all the docking facilities, all the boats, and all the industrial oil and gas type facilities. An unauthorized discharge of natural gas occurred during the nitrogen replacement activity associated with commissioning of the South LNG tanker. Nitrogen must be removed from the tank prior to the initial startup of the tank by flowing natural gas into the tank in order to displace the nitrogen. They were having a lot, a lot of problems. You can see that in the rest of the paragraphs on that page. Then on page 22 on February the 4th, they notified the Louisiana State Police hazmat hotline of a potential exceedance of nitrogen oxide from the facility's turbines. At the time of the initial notification, it was estimated that 3,360 pounds of nitrogen oxide had been released to the atmosphere. After further review and calculation, they determined that the incident was within the permitted emission limits. The reportable quantity of nitrogen oxide was not exceeded. 
On February 19th, there was an event. On February the 23rd, there was an event. On February the 28th, there was an event. Three events in the month of February. On March 9th, a complaint was received. So there is a gentleman in that area who is always observing and always, always complaining. The complaint was received at LDEQ that Venture Global had been flaring since Thursday afternoon at 4.15, continuously 24 hours a day. And we're going to see some of those flames in a minute. The flaring is still occurring with a black smoke discharge. The time, 3.09 p.m. Venture Global responded that Global undergoing their commissioning and startup process, the facility has a phase commissioning and startup, which is the cause of the flaring. All reported readings are below reportable quantity. April 28th, here comes our gentleman again. A complaint was received that a large yellow flame from the marine flare and black sooty ash around the flame was being released by the facility. The facility reported to DEQ that it had been performing commissioning activities and that their north flare located at the jetty area, the smoke was coming out. The opacity during that smoke event was under 20% opacity, so it was all okay. On May 6, he complained again, and it was a large black plume. He doesn't like the flames, and he doesn't like the black plume. So DEQ conducted a complaint investigation on May 12th near that facility, but did not make entry to the facility. So I come right up to your gate, and I look at everything that's going on, but I don't come in and ask you if I can do an inspection. I go back to the office. So what good does that do, the person that complained? He thought something bad was happening. So this is the kind of response you get from the agency. And so constantly this gentleman is complaining. On August the 24th, Venture had 100 gallons of slop water released from an overflowing storage tank into a concrete secondary containment. So they said the containment, which is like a little berm, contained it so it was all okay. 17th of September, they had a release of natural gas to the air from a leaking pipeline. A total of 774 pounds of natural gas was released. How much money do you think they lost from that release? Then we look at the criteria it releases in 2021, and you see carbon monoxide, nitrogen oxide, particulate matter, sulfur dioxide. You see toxic air pollutants, all listed. Now we move into Chenier, which is on the border of Louisiana and Texas. We're on page 25. The following three pages are aerial photographs of the Chenier Sabine Pass LNG facility near Johnson Bayou in Cameron Pass. The first aerial shows the six liquefied natural gas storage tanks and an LNG transport ship right next to the tanks where they load. And so anytime you see aerial photographs with six tanks, that's Chenier. So the first aerial shows the six liquefaction. The second and third aerial shows all the LNG equipment. So it gives you some idea of what the equipment looks like even though when you pass by, you can start seeing that part. So Chenier, on January the 21st, reported to a DEQ that train six, which includes a six inch liquefied natural gas storage tank, was currently under construction. So when I show you six, the sixth one is under construction, the one through five are being loaded and from there loaded on the ships. Sabine completion, the train six, was in February of 2022 
and during Train 6 commissioning activity on February the 4th, the following emissions were released. Oops, we finally got it built, we checked it out, and when we go to load, we have, oops. The total following emissions were released. Total propane, total ethane, nitrogen oxide, carbon monoxide, volatile organics. On April the 18th, DEQ was notified of a four-inch flange leaking natural gas. On September the 10th, Chenier Sabine Pass notified DEQ that four LNG storage tanks vented approximately 83,000 pounds of methane, which is a flammable gas, to the atmosphere due to the false level responding. So this is their storage tanks, and they can't load them properly. And then from the storage tanks, they load the ships. So uh huh. You, you can give them this report. It came all out of their files. But, but our permit writer over here doesn't look at the enforcement file. So, all so it all that. depends on who comes. You know, she can say, I wrote the best permit. But, but if she's doing enforcement, she can say, this but is the track record. Right. that's coming out of these tanks, all the chemicals that's coming out of the tanks, are harmful, right? Yes, very toxic. And here we're talking about putting in seven more? A bunch more. Yes. This is ridiculous. Okay, so, so when y'all have, have these papers for next week when LDQ come, they wouldn't come because they knew Wilma was here tonight. So they called yeah. me and told me they'll be Ten here women. just them. But they don't realize that we're not going to just have them. We're going to have pro and con here because we want to know, what about these? Because they want to try to tell us next week that LNG is not bad plants. Right. Industry is worse than LNG. Then you hear LNG saying industry is worse than us. But who's suffering? We are. So we'll get ready for them next week. So on the last page of the handout, and then we're going to go to the videos, you see a listing of criteria and toxic air pollutants. And then you see under summary of criterion air pollutants. Chenier Sabine Pass facility has the highest quantities of air emissions of criteria and toxic air pollutants for all parameters with the exception of PM10 in 2021. Remember, we don't have the data from 2022 yet. So Chenier is the highest emitter with the exception of PM10. Hackberry, Semper Cameron Hackberry, has the second highest quantity of air emissions of criteria and toxic pollutants, with the exception of PM10, for which the facility ranks highest in air emissions of PM10. Venture Global in Cameron has the smallest quantity of air emission of the criteria and toxic air pollutants when compared to other two LNG facilities. So, you have a choice. Which one do you most want to live by? None. If we the public speak up, somebody gonna listen. And that's why I'm happy you're here tonight. Okay. Uh, because I knew something was happening because I sit on my porch and right next to the multipurpose and I teach my grandson, I say, you see that black smoke? It be coming from this way. Then when we look, it, it moves and there's a big old uh, yellowish, pink, orange, some kind of uh, color be over it. I told him that's the poison, the color. And then it goes around toward Mars Bluff. Mm -hmm. So you probably gonna have to get rid of people in Mars Bluff too. Because <laughs> if I see it, he see it, she see it, everybody else seen it. Well, well that's, I'm going to show you 
yeah. when when we had someone yeah. go out. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh huh. Just a second. Let me grab this. Uh huh. Yeah. I just want to point out that the last one that Venture Global Calcasieu passed was only operating for two months in 2021. So of course they're the lowest. Yeah. Right. So we'll have to wait and see what 2022 says. Right. But yeah, they're, none of them are good. None. Okay. So now you don't have the handout for this, but my daughter's going to help you. But first, I want to tell you about where this came from. Okay? This is called optical gas imaging. It looks like a TV camera. And the survey was done in Calcasieu and Cameron parishes. And it was performed by TCHD consulting, and it was paid for and contracted with him by Earthworks. And I am chairman of the board of Earthworks. So environmental monitoring surveys and assessments were conducted to characterize air emissions from specific industrial facilities and LNG facilities in Calcasieu and Cameron parishes and the work was done June 20 through 23 of 2022. June 20 through 23 of this year. The facilities to be surveyed were the three LNG facilities, Sasso, Westlake Chemical, Sitco, Phillips 66, Louisiana Pigment, and Firestone. When relevant opportunities presented themselves, the environmental assessment was also conducted in neighborhoods where potential downwind receptors exist, including but not limited to multiple environmental justice communities. Project field observations were conducted to, one, characterize air emissions of hydrocarbons, particulate matter, emissions and heat. Teledyne flare camera was being used. The optical gas imaging camera allows for the visual detection of both heat and chemical compounds. So the first one we're going to see, she's going to run it while I tell you about what the person doing the camera described. We have an event occurring here. Looks like some two little gentlemen made some papers that they want to deliver. Okay, I'm going to tell you. I'm going to read it and tell you. Good job. Good. Yay. Go back. I'm going to tell them what that says. Okay, you ready or not? Yeah, it's running. It's running? Okay. Sorry, where you, they drew your view array away from the bit. So this one's a Sempra Cameron Hackberry. LNG emissions were prevalent at Sempra Hackberry and filled the horizon above the company and in the downwind airshed. On June the 20th, significant lofting emissions from multiple hot stacks were documented. The emissions were identified as hydrocarbons, and we've been hearing hydrocarbons and toxic chemicals all night. Those toxic chemicals are the hydrocarbons. Minutes later, expansive emissions from multiple hot exhaust stacks were documented. The third video of Semper Hackberry documented hydrocarbon emissions continually being released from multiple exhaust stacks. These emissions fill the, horiz hor the horizon above and well beyond the property boundaries of the facility. Well beyond the property boundaries of the facility. Semper emissions were significant and appeared to be understated on permit representation. The emission plume impacts extended out for distances away from the emission source. 
It's still running. Oh yeah, but I can open it after. No, let, let it let it run. So can y'all see it? Oh yeah. Okay. Is it finished or not? You still got five minutes left. It's what? Still got five minutes left. Let it go. Let it go. Let them see it. The, the color is what you see through the camera, <laughs> but the color, the, the things that are moving are the emission stacks, um, emission <coughs> plumes. Yeah. So these yeah. aren't things that are burnt up, that's gases that are being released? Yeah, it's coming out of stacks. Yeah. You can sort of see the stacks, and then you can see as the emissions are released. And then that's when he's saying that it, he thinks it doesn't match the permit. He thinks it's much higher than the permit limits. Mm -hmm. Wow. That's exactly what we see. <coughs> That's exactly what we see. Yes. But, but you're not seeing all of it. You're no. seeing the visible part, and he's seeing the invisible but part I added to it. I had to have something coming from this way. Because it was real dark there, too. Mm -hmm. But then all at once, you see the, uh, the pinkish. That's what you see in there. That's what we see every afternoon. Yes. Sitting on my porch. I knew I wasn't losing it. No. I knew something was happening because I explained it. I said, the black smoke is dangerous, but that pink one, that's where the boys are at. Well, this camera sees what you can't see.
Okay, just let me, let me just interrupt. That's the facility in Cameron that's running now. Huh? The, the video you see now is the LNG facility in Cameron. Okay, and this is Shanir coming up. This is Shanir. This is Shanir. And excess emissions were being released from many hot exhaust stacks along with some uncombustible and combustible emissions from the leftmost lit flare. 25 minutes later, extensive emissions were being released from many heated stacks. The plumes quickly lost heat within a few feet of being exhausted. The flare camera detected hydrocarbon plumes. Additional uncombusted, partially combusted hydrocarbon emissions were also being emitted by the flare in the left portion of the video. On June the 23rd, the flare camera documented continuing significant site-wide emissions from plus 30 hot extraction stacks that were often excessive hydrocarbons over the horizon. Multiple lit flares were documented. On June the 20th and 23rd, the facilities were actively releasing excess hydrocarbon emissions. The emissions lofted over the horizon and extended far away from the emission sources. Emissions were significant and are likely underrepresented on permits as pollutants were added to the airshed far beyond the company's property lines. LNG emissions were prevalent at the Chenier facility and fill the horizon above the facility and in a downwind airshed. Chenier's stood out in magnitude compared to Calcasieu Pash and Hackberry LNG facilities. You mean they got all those stacks in one area? That's all the video from Chenier. Wow. It's still running. Yeah. Wow. Do you make money? Do Sasol. So now our favorite facility, Sasol. So let me just tell you the notes that go with Sasol while she's bringing it up. Released exhaust stack emissions are significant. Flare poorly combusting. Emissions from three hot exhaust stacks. The three plumes quickly lost heat content within feet 
of being released. The most prevalent source on site was a lit flare that was releasing significant uncombusted, partially combusted emissions that were very evident. So this is Sasol. I have, um, I want to show you, I want to really read Louisiana Pig. A significant plume that was visible to the bare eyes was visible across the horizon. The extensive plume was tracked back to Louisiana Pig, I don't think you have this one, facility. Monitoring documented rooftop vent pipe emissions from four different stacks that were not visible to the bare eye, but were visible by the camera. Other significant emissions were being e emitted for a large vertical special exhaust stack that was visible to the bare eye and has been tracked back to the source via vehicle patrol. He came out of where he was staying and it was so prevalent in the air that he actually went on a patrol to identify the source. The large stack emissions were significant and steaming and the magnitude of the plume was made particularly evident. The exhaust emissions appeared to have potential to impact downward properties. Which are the ones you have pulled? So this is what you don't see with your eye, except when you see the flares. But you see when you use this special camera. Philip 66. OK, she's putting it up. Five hydrocarbon storage tanks had additional hydrocarbon emissions. Top vent emissions were being released from a fixed roof storage tank. The emissions tended to crawl along the outside of the tank wall. Remember when we had the mobile monitor and it said at the bottom of the tank was where the emissions were. And we had a lot of discussion on that. Minutes later, continuous hydrocarbon emissions were released from the top vent of the storage tank then sank and moved along the tank wall from left to right. Hydrocarbon emissions that were not visible to the bare eye were being steadily released from the top vent of the storage tank, number 338. A fourth video documented hydrocarbon emissions being continuously released from two different fixed roof storage tanks. So yes, it is happening at all the other industrial facilities all besides the, the LNG. All the world, but the thing I'm saying is that when it happens, we should be able to get something from it. The people that's gonna suffer it. EPA said, EPA said that that's it. they are allowed to kill a certain amount of people. That's what EPA said. Y'all wanna see Firestone? Last one. Okay. Okay, let me tell you what Firestone descriptor was. Okay, Firestone. 
Firestone was releasing significant lofty emissions being emitted from a large exhaust stack. The emissions were quite substantial. The emissions became ambient temperature a few feet after being exhausted and consist of uncombustible gases, toxic. So with the accidental releases and the description of each of the LNG facilities, and then these videos from the flare camera, but not only the LNG facilities, but some of the industrial facilities. Does that help you better understand what's going on and what you may or may not be being exposed to? Yes, ma'am. Yeah. The point that I don't understand, the point that I don't understand, Ms. Wilma, is the fact that we know all of this is happening everywhere, not just here. No. Why the people that's going to suffer from it don't receive anything about it? I mean, from it. And I'm talking about suing nobody. It should be a un it should be understood if if I, if I get a permit to do anything. In, in Thank you, Wilma. That was beautiful. You're welcome. And that's just the tip of the iceberg. Yeah, I believe that. So therefore, we got to remember one thing: that God is.